Good morning and welcome to the Deanery Garden on this Saturday the 12th of June as we come to say our morning prayers. We're here in the front of the house but we've got a special shot here which looks very much like a wedding bouquet and uh, the dogwood flowers actually are showing something that actually is going to happen here today because today is a wedding day for our Receiver Generals, who's the administrator of the Cathedral's PA, Daisy, and she and Terence are getting married in the Cathedral, so the, the crypt is full of flowers, which her own mother has arranged there. But the flowers you're looking at, and it's a, a lovely day for, for, for Daisy and Terence here today, and some of you may remember Daisy if you uh, had contact with the Friends Office of Canterbury Cathedral because she was for a while the assistant to Caroline in the Friends Office. So we wish Daisy and Terence well on this day, but what we are actually looking at is a, a, a wonderful array of dogwood in the deanery front garden. And we're here with Clemmy and the Little Piggets, but for the moment let's think about these dogwoods because we are going around the nations as we think about them. The nearest to the camera is actually a variegated English version with very self-effacing flowers. But then the big one that you've been seeing is from China and that's Cornus Cusa. And then as I come along here, there's another China one. And then after that, American dogwoods from Flori Florida. Now, we're used to seeing dogwoods in enormous profusion and love doing so, either in the United States or in China. They, there is as much profusion as hawthorn is in England, but it's not often in England you see dogwoods. So we planted some here in this space. I think I've said before, trees were planted to remind us of areas of the world that we're fond of. And here we have China and the United States in dogwood with our own much more self-effacing English one that is uh, variegated leaf, so decorative in leaf. But the, 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 the wonderful flowers in the sunshine are just at their best of the dogwoods that have been planted. So thank you, Cornus Cusa, and all the other Cornus varieties that are along this particular hedge in the uh, field in front of the deanery with the trees from across the world. Let's begin our prayers on this Saturday morning. O Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. May Christ the day star dawn in our hearts and triumph over the shades of night. Blessed are you, sovereign God, creator of all. To you be glory and praise forever. You founded the earth in the beginning, and the heavens are the work of your hands. In the fullness of time you made us in your image, and in these last days you have spoken to us in your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh. As we rejoice in the gift of your presence among us, let the light of your love always shine in our hearts, your Spirit ever renew our lives, and your praises ever be on our lips. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Blessed be God forever. The night has passed, and the day lies open before us. Let us pray with one heart and mind. And as we rejoice in the gift of this new day, so may the light of your presence, O God, set our hearts on fire with love for you, now and forever. Amen. Our morning psalm on this twelfth of the month is Psalm 62. On God alone my soul in stillness waits. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, so that I shall never be shaken. How long will all of you assail me to destroy me, as you would a tottering wall or a leaning fence? They plot only to thrust me down from my place of honour. Lies are their chief delight. They bless with their mouth, but in their heart they curse. Wait on God alone in stillness, O my soul, for in him is my hope. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, so that I shall not be shaken. In God is my strength and my glory. 
God is my strong rock. In him is my refuge. Put your trust in him always, my people. Pour out your hearts before him, for God is our refuge. The peoples are but a breath. The whole human race a deceit. On the scales they are altogether lighter than air. So put no trust in oppression. In robbery take no empty pride. Though wealth increase, set not your heart upon it. God spoke once, and twice have I heard the same, that power belongs to God. Steadfast love belongs to you, O Lord, for you repay everyone according to their deeds. So we're returning after our venture elsewhere on St. Barnabas Day to the Gospel of St. Matthew. And I'm beginning to read where we left off and Jesus having had the experience of healing the daughter of the Canaanite or Syrophoenician woman is going on from there in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 15, verse 29. Jesus went on from there and walked beside the Sea of Galilee and he went up on the mountain and sat down there and great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they laid them at his feet, and he healed them, so that the crowd wondered when they saw the mute speaking, the crippled healthy, the lame walking, the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel. Then Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint on the way. And the disciples said to him, Where are we to get enough bread in such a desolate place to feed so great a crowd? And Jesus said to them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, seven, and a few small fish. And directing the crowd to sit down on the ground, he took the seven loaves and the fish, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the crowds. And they all ate and were satisfied, and they took up seven baskets full of the broken pieces left over, those who ate were 4,000 men besides women and children. And after sending away the crowds, he got into the boat and went to the region of Magadan. Well, you might find that story a bit familiar because it's not too long ago that in St. Matthew's Gospel we read the story of the feeding of the people. But in that story, if you remember, there were 5,000 men besides women and children. Now Matthew says 4,000 men besides women and children. He's taking the story from Mark's account, but if you remember when we were reflecting on St. Mark's Gospel, I think last year now, um, we saw the two feedings of the people as being very different kinds of feedings. And it takes us back also to the fourth gospel with the feeding of the 5,000 there. The first feeding in St. Mark's gospel has the crowd there in regulated form and men only sitting down in units. And you remember how Mark is, is portraying this uh, as the way in which the people in that particular feeding in his gospel are wanting Jesus to be their strong leader and they're set out and it's men only at the 5,000 in Mark they're set out like an army and Jesus resists that I don't know if it ever was a temptation but to be a strong leader to throw out the Roman army and give the nation back to his own people is that what the Messiah, the Anointed One, was for? And remember in Mark's Gospel at the end, 12 basketfuls of 
fragments were picked up, just as in Matthew with the 5,012 basket. And the 12 is a sign of the Jewish nation and the apostles taking on that, that, that role of the 12, just as there were the 12 tribes when the manna came down from heaven. And this is different because Matthew doesn't make the same kind of correlation. In Mark's Gospel, Jesus goes away from that temptation and, and resists it. In John's Gospel, in the same way, uh, it says because he thought that the people were wanting to make him king, he went away and hid himself. And so that the coming apart to be by themselves becomes not just a rest for the disciples, but also a hiding from that particular kind of temptation. Now Matthew is not using it in that way at all. Notice he adds to the 5,000, 5,000 men besides women and children. And then again, for the 4,000, 4,000 men besides women and children. There's not the same distinction, but the 12 baskets and the seven baskets, and seven is the number of the deacons who were set out to serve the Hellenists to begin with, and then to feed the world. It's the breaking out of that into the world. And between comes, and Mark's sequence is the same, the story of the Syrophoenician woman, the Canaanite woman, because um, that too is a, a significant moment for Jesus. He's in a, a foreign land and a foreigner is asking him for help. And somehow at that moment, a new step in ministry is taken. And Jesus decides that he is the anointed one for all nations. When he is lifted up, if we use the fourth gospel language, his arms will be outstretched for all nations. And when, it's when the Greeks come to him in the temple and say through first Philip and then Andrew, sir, we'd like to see Jesus. And Jesus responds by saying, the hour has come and I, when I am lifted up, will draw all nations to myself. And that becomes uh, the way in which the ministry develops. Here, <clears throat> we're talking much more about resources and welfare. That's how Matthew sees it. And in the first story, in Matthew, the 5,000, you remember the, the disciples say, send the people away. We've done enough work for today with them. And Jesus says, no, they need resources and you feed them. And there's a teaching moment, but there's also the moment when Jesus, in withdrawing himself and then helping the disciples in the boat later, is thinking they're not ready yet. And uh, that is either a disappointment to him or else something that he himself realizes he has to give more resources to the twelve. Here are more resources to the people to be nourished and fed and their welfare looked after. And notice that these are people who have followed him around that shoreline of the Sea of Galilee when they've stepped out of the, the, the boat and, and then, then the, the crowds have been with me three days, says Jesus. So Matthew is talking about resources and welfare for the crowd in this story of the feeding of the 4,000 and the crowd once again a mixture of men and of women and of children as well. Well, <coughs> let's just think a little bit about this. I want to think about the G7 meeting which is happening in Cornwall at the moment. We talked about the world leaders from the G7 countries, together with leaders who are guests from other nations, uh, coming together in Cornwall. Now, Cornwall is the very western tip of the, uh, of the United Kingdom, uh, of, of, of the England, rather, down at the, 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 the extreme southwest and if we go from Canterbury, which is the extreme southeast, poking out in the sea towards France, uh, and then go in a journey all the way to Cornwall, we've actually gone in a, 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 on a journey which is as big as going to Scotland. It's a long, long way from east to west or west to east along the south coast. And that's where the leaders are, at St. Austral, on that beautiful stretch. 
of Cornish coast. The Roseland Heritage Protected Area, but many more along there because it is a beautiful coastline, but very near the sea, which gives us the same kind of landscape in our particularity as Jesus was having with the crowds and the disciples looking after their welfare along the Sea of Galilee. And we hope that the G7 leaders will actually um, be looking after the welfare of the whole world during pandemic and also the welfare of our planet. Now, interestingly enough, when Her Majesty the Queen and other members of the royal family met them yesterday, it was at the location of the Eden Project near Sid Ostel in Cornwall. And the Eden Project is the most interesting kind of project. It was opened, uh, I think, in 2001 <coughs> and was the uh, uh, brainchild of Tim Smith but it contains, and you can, you can Google this and, and, and look at it, huge domes of biomes, as they're called, and inside are the climates of, uh, the, 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 the climates of different areas of the world, but it's also a temperate area, to, area in, it, in itself which can grow various plants. Now, one of the biomes represents, and is, when you step inside it very clearly, uh, tropical. And in there you can find fruiting banana plants and coffee and rubber and giant bamboo and all kinds of things. You are walking in areas that might be rainforest or tropical vegetation. In the next one, you're in a Mediterranean biome. And, and that uh, is, is where you will find things like olives and vines fruiting and the kind of things you would expect to find around the Mediterranean Sea and some of the things and plant life that, that Jesus and his disciples would have been with the crowds there on the side of the Sea of Galilee. And then finally, the temperate zone in Cornwall really is temperate. And there, in that garden, most of the time, you can grow quite successfully tea and lavender, hops and hemp and sunflowers, lovely things. We once, in a, in a Dean's Conference, some years ago now, were at Choro Cathedral and went on a little um, journey to the Eden Project. And I have a tremendously uh, uh, precious photograph of all the deans getting off the bus that took us to the Eden Project and behind them, behind the deans of the English cathedrals, is a notice saying, this way to Eden. And uh, I, I always think that rather amusing, that we were going to find the, the, the place which is most beautiful there. It's a place to learn about biodiversity and the care of the planet. And the uh, Queen and Royal Family met the leaders just there, and you will have seen clips of, first of all, a very formal photograph at the reception for the leaders themselves, and it was there that Her Majesty looked round at the faces of the leaders as they posed for their photographs and said, are you supposed to be looking as if you're enjoying yourself? Which raised a laugh, which was good for the photograph. But again, after that, the Queen, together with the Duchess of Cambridge and the Duchess of Cornwall, went to the, the big lunch, which this year is was able to happen outside and in a distance way which the Eden Project throws for friends and neighbours and Her Majesty was able to talk about the situation as she's found it in lockdown and, and there is a, a conversation there also where she is talking to one of the health workers and you can find this easily online and the health worker spoke about it afterwards because this health worker frontline health worker had contracted COVID and also uh, went home but her husband also contracted that and he died and now uh, the health worker has recovered and she's back at work and at that point um, the, her, her Majesty said so how are you coping and the health worker then turned the, the, the situation around to her and said well uh, as you are ma'am because you've had the same experience of losing your husband and we, we carry on for, for the, the good of the work we're doing. Um, but the, the nicest point, and it's, it's so, so like the Queen, um, who is followed by the Lord Lieutenant of any county in formal uniform with a dress sword. She was asked to cut the cake, which was the symbol of the big lunch, 
And the most important part of the big lunch was that she could mingle physically with people. She talked about how limiting Zoom conversations are, though she's engaged in them a lot. But she was talking physically to the people and uh, she was asked to cut the cake and she turned to um, Edward Belido, the Lord Lieutenant of, of Cornwall, and said, give me your ceremonial sword. And she took it out. <laughs> and uh, the, the, someone standing by said, there is a knife there, ma'am, for cutting the cake. And she said, yes, but this is much more unusual. And was very aware of the moment to, to make formality suddenly an implement and domestic utensil before she went on. Well, we give thanks for that big lunch. But we give thanks even more that the leaders of the G7 are there with the capacity to help the welfare of this planet, both in pandemic and the, the nations suffering most from that, with resources for health and welfare, but also its biodiversity and the care of the life of our planet and all its creatures and plants. We remember that on this day when Jesus, in a sense, had his own uh, big supper on the side of the Sea of Galilee, and Matthew points to the giving of welfare, nourishment, health and healing to the crowds. I wanted just to name one person who on this day died in 1962, and that's the composer John Ireland, who was born in 1879 and was uh, well known for his piano concerto and made famous by his second violin sonata. But he is best known by all of us, probably, for his hymn tune to the hymn, My song is love unknown, my saviour's love to me, love to the loveless shown, that they might lovely be. And that hymn tune is one that is much beloved but at the same time, he wrote an anthem which is sung often. And it's sung at, at memorial services of those who've laid down their life for others. But it begins, many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. I'm, I'm sure you will know it. His music is sung often uh, in cathedral repertoires and in parish church repertoires. I think on Tuesday, our, last Tuesday, our cathedral choir sang the setting by Ireland in F. And I well remember in parish churches the communion service, Ireland in C, being sung, and the attraction of the lovely Agnes Dei in that. But another thing which he wrote, which gives me enormous pleasure, is for treble voices only. And <coughs> he's given it a Latin title, Ex Ore Innocentium, out of the mouths of the innocent, of babes and sucklings, you have brought forth perfect praise. And those aren't the words. The words are of the treble line singing, it is a thing most wonderful. And that hymn, it is a thing most wonderful, which tells of God's love, sending his only son to die to save, and the words of that hymn, a child like me. Well, we're all children of God, and uh, so that, him which Ireland has set so beautifully in an anthem is one that is precious. He was a church organist himself. In 1904 he became church organist of St Luke's Chelsea and was that till 1926 and composed so many songs from English poets, Houseman and Christina Rossetti, Thomas Hardy, Sea Fever which we read recently by John Maysfield and Rupert Brooke as well. So I give thanks as we all do for John Ireland and the way he's brought those words, my song is love unknown, my saviour's love to me, love to the loveless shown, that, let's use a pronoun, we might lovely be on this morning as we remember him with thanksgiving. Let us uh, say our prayers now, and we are praying this morning in the Anglican Communion for the Diocese of Cashel, Ferns and Ossery in the Church of Ireland, the Dublin province of the Church of Ireland. We're praying in our diocese. This is what we call a listening and discerning on the way day, meaning that everyone is thinking, how is this situation affecting us and giving us time to reflect on how we respond to that love of God, which Ireland says God showed us 
in the coming of his son. So um, that we remember as we remember Justin, our Archbishop, Rose, Bishop of Dover, and uh, um, Tim, Bishop at Lambeth, and all the parishes of our diocese. So at this point, we will say the colic for today. Let's remember the G7 leaders, but all those that they have the capacity to help and need that help. So I'm using the collect here for the first Sunday after Trinity, for the last time. Bring your own intentions and prayers. O oh God, the strength of all those who put their trust in you, mercifully accept our prayers, and because through the weakness of our mortal nature we can do no good thing without you, grant us the help of your grace that in keeping of your commandments we may please you both in will and deed, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So each in our own language now, we say the prayer our Saviour taught us, and then we'll keep silence uh, for our own prayers on this Saturday morning. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit <clears throat> be upon you, upon those whom you love, and those whom you would pray for, today <clears throat> and always. Amen.